Welcome back to the $1 million Tipping Point podcast. Today on the show, we have Kira Lescu, and obviously I'm your host, Kiri Mohan. So Kiri and Kira, it's going to be great. You're all going to understand it just fine. <laughs> so um, this podcast episode is brought to you by Corporate to Contract, the number two in there, the place to go if you have corporate or office experience and want to take the skills you have and become your own boss and online contractor. Do you love the podcast? Don't forget to sign up for the Tipping Jar of Wisdom, where as a subscriber, you get access to exclusive content every Thursday straight to your inbox with actionable tasks from our guests that will help you grow your business. Head over and connect with me on Instagram at Virtually Kiri or LinkedIn, Kiri Mohan. Sign up through my bio. So hello, Kira. Welcome to the show. Hi, Kiri. I'm so excited to be here today because I took a look through your podcast and it looked like you had so many amazing things that are just so essential to a journey to that seven figures and beyond. And yeah, I'm so excited to share what I can to help others get there today. And I think you're going to be a super helpful episode because for our guests, I mean, for our audience, um, Kira is basically specialized in stress and burnout. So Kira is the founder and CEO of the Eagle Institute Limited and has over 25 years of experience, having built seven businesses, two of which reached multi-million dollar sales. Kira has been nominated two times for RBC, Canadian Woman Entrepreneur of the Year for Startups. She started the Eagle Institute to help business leaders and entrepreneurs learn the skills that helped her the most on her business and personal journey with meditation and self-healing skills. Her clients have healed issues such as stress and burnout or even personal growth issues in less than a year when they had been struggling with the same issues often for decades. She is personally certified as an advanced yoga and pranayama teacher trainer, which she completed 18 years ago. Since that time, she's trained in mindfulness, Vajrayana, psychic healing, and Ho Ono Pono Pono. So this last thing, Ho Ono Pono Pono, I know is Hawaiian. I lived in Hawaii for a little yeah. bit, a brief stint. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Because that just sounds like uh, I just tripped over words when I'm yeah. pretty sure I didn't. <laughs> so it's really interesting we're starting with this because I would say the foundation of all the work that I've done in the Eagle Institute has a basis, all meditation, everything to rapidly improve yourself is some level of Pono Pono Pono, which also very much ties in with yogic science and a lot of the Buddhist practices and even most major religions around the world. Um, in Hawaiian, and it's pronounced Ho O Pono Pono, and it's all those words are together. Now, ho-o means to make, and pono means right. And the Hawaiian culture does not duplicate words. So that's very significant. So pono pono means to make really, really right. So what does that mean? Um, it means that when we have something that isn't going the way we want, it's emotionally upsetting, we're not seeing things correctly. We have problems maybe with money, with personal growth, with relationships, with health. At the root cause of that, it's something that's in energy. And that energy manifests as thought. And if you can't control those thoughts, you have emotions. And then you may have karma, which means you can't see things clearly. Um, and it manifests as things in our lives that we may not choose to have. So Ho'ono Pono Pono in the whole suite of those techniques, which starts with the four basic statements, which you'll probably see many places on YouTube or on the internet, uh, about half of them are said correctly and about half of them aren't. Um, sometimes it gets changed. Um, it's about four components. The first is taking responsibility. And how that is usually expressed is, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I regret. And in certain cultures, they understand that. Other cultures, they don't <laughs> um, understand the responsibility aspect of it. The other is, uh, please forgive me. And the person we're really forgiving is ourselves because um, we created the situation. So it's really taking personal responsibility and changing the situation. And then thank you and I love you. Thank you is appreciation. So appreciation is the understanding that it's already done. That's using law of attraction 
to know that something's already done. And then I love you. That's connection to whatever you call higher consciousness. So whether you call that God or source or the universe, really those are different things, <laughs> but it, whatever you connect with as a higher power, even if you're not even sure that there is one, it's the understanding that there is a force in the universe that's pure love and that love wipes out the negativity and that you can tune into that and that is what gives the power to change situations for the better to the extent we're willing to do it <laughs> so when you're working with these methods with your clients are you did you create something like a framework that's unique to your eagle institute or do you yes. maybe see a client say, I'm going to use mindfulness specifically with this person, yoga specifically with this person, et cetera. To a certain extent. So it's certainly approaching people where they're at and what they're ready for. Um, some people have, they're so far down the path that they need to deal with things in a physical way, as well as the faster ways, <laughs> which are mental, emotional is even faster. And then there's certain things that um, techniques that can work on all four levels, including spiritual at the same time. Uh, so there's an understanding of where they're ready for and how fast that they can move. Uh, all of our techniques do move very quickly. And so they're drawn from the different levels. Also taking into account how far they need to go. So we're not going to give somebody like a hundred meter dash speed if um, they only need to walk a few steps, right? We're, we're going to make it appropriate to the level of change that needs to be made, but still doing it as fast as possible that they're ready for given the situation. And I have an enormous amount. I like have 23,000 hours of personal practice on multiple styles and techniques, as well as having trained thousands of people, mostly entrepreneurs and business owners um, on various techniques. So it's really um, getting people identifying where they're at and getting them to the next level in an appropriate way that, that also works with their beliefs too, right? Because you can't work against beliefs. Belief drives everything. <laughs> what do you mean by that? Can you go into more specific, like an example maybe of someone who you can't work against whatever belief system they have? Yeah. So I was working with one entrepreneur that really believed that um, certain people just couldn't change. So even though this person was extremely advanced, they were karma free, but they still had this belief, well, you know, it's just, it's impossible for certain people to change. That person could actually change, but not for them. Because yeah. you, you create our own reality. So they're creating the version of the people that they're interacting with. So I took some very advanced techniques for this person to overcome that, but then they were actually open to it. They opened a little crack in the relationships. Interestingly, that it changed first um, was a former romantic partner that they are still involved with because um, they had actually owned a business together. <laughs> um, oh. <laughs> uh, a child, one of their kids um, and a current business um, partner that was in yeah. another business. So they just thought, well, this is just always going to be this way. Um, but then it was like, well, they, I was, they were creating that version of that person. So it really was up to them to change themselves and their perceptions and their beliefs so that it was strong enough that they could get a different response from that person to the extent that that person was capable. So it's not manipulating the other person. It's allowing that other person when they're ready to step into a better version of themselves. And they were shocked. They were absolutely and shocked. <laughs> how often do you, share. how often do you encounter people who basically you were saying like they have created a version of themselves based on their belief. Is that everyone though? Everyone's doing that always. Yeah. Everyone's doing that always. 
um because our lives are an expression of our beliefs hmm. like if we hold yeah. on to a belief long enough it's going to manifest in some way it might be something yeah. little it might be something big um but those can be shifted too so i did learn um you know through a little bit of like law of attraction studying how even when you're saying you don't want something to happen, right? Like, I really hope this doesn't happen. I really hope this doesn't happen. I really, and then it happens. You're like, oh, I was hoping it wouldn't happen. I knew it. That's almost like manifesting it as well. well. It, we're manifesting all the time. We can't stop unless you can completely stop your mind, which there are people today that can do that, that completely stop the mind. Mind manifests. Emotions are indicators of what's manifesting. And when you get really, really good at manifesting, and if you're a really good meditator, you can even feel it, what's manifesting pre-emotion. Mm. But that's sophisticated. And But I, there are people today that have that level of ability, meditation-wise, certainly. So I when I was looking through your um, just research on you, I found a lot about your breathing for high performance and what you advise yeah. and how can you share with us how to breathe correctly i don't know if this is something we'd have to go to you yeah for like well, months and months of training bit, but a little bit yeah. quickly the, the the first thing is breathing affects first of all your physical state so it affects your um fight or flight response being able to turn it on or off and then it affects all 21 physical systems in your, in your body from a health perspective. It affects your mental state, your emotions, and it affects you spiritually. And it does spiritual extremely quickly, extremely. It is the fastest, um, unless you have someone who's at the level of a master or beyond a master where they can look at you and hold their mental emotional state so steady that you get a miracle um pranayama is can be at that level um and works up to a million times faster sometimes even millions times faster so it's the first thing with pranayama is to set up straight because you cannot breathe your lungs cannot the the bottom part of the lungs all the way around is the part that's relaxing and calming so if you're not sitting up straight with a spine erect um and for some people this takes learning how to do this it does not come easily i've even taught people um you know world-class athletes are on their way to becoming world-class athletes um people that have exercised for years, marathoners, extremely good at that, but their lower lungs are caught. So they're in an agitated state almost all the time. And when you're exercising and doing that, and I was one of those when I was younger, a lot of the time, um, it, it creates more stress. And then that activates that part of your brain. Um, so you're, it's very difficult to get out of that state. So the body needs to be relaxed, sitting up straight is number one. And then the first step is training the different parts of your lungs to work properly. Um, the inhale and the exhale to be even and it to be activating the right parts of the lungs. And then beyond that, there's a number of things, having pauses, healthy pauses at the right points in your breathing at the beginning of the inhale, beginning of the exhale. Some people unconsciously hold their breath a lot, um, either in or out. Um, if you have a high state of consciousness and you're not creating strain, that's fine. If you can't do that in a relaxed state, it makes the stress and overwhelm way, way, way worse. <laughs> so there's a number of things connected to that. And we work with people and some people actually have their lower diaphragm um, or parts of it is stuck. So that's the bottom part of your lungs. So it makes it very difficult to breathe deeply and to get rid of certain emotions and to change, to change beliefs and things because everything's connected. <laughs> so we think, oh, you know, I have, I, I, you know, I'm just going to tell you a funny story. A long time ago when I was first learning this, I used to have my SI, so my uh, sacroiliac joint, which is the bottom of your spine out all the time. And it used to hurt a lot when I was driving, but even hurt when I was sitting in a desk a lot. And then 
I, I was doing a practice one day and I'm like, what, like, I just want this gone. What is it? And it literally, um, people in my family would call me a, a pain in the backside or a, a, like a, a PIA as a child, which is a pain in the, you know what, yeah. um, and I was really hyper kids. So it was like, they weren't, they weren't saying anything that wasn't true. I was loud. I was hyper at a ton of energy. Um, but that energy got stuck literally in my butt. Um, and I laughed so hard because hearing the words, even though I didn't even know at that age what that meant, I did not know what those words meant, but my energy did. So I trapped that. And as soon as th that happened, I was laughing my head off and, I, and literally my spine released and let go. Hmm. And that, 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 that quickly was that quickly. And it was gone because I understood what it was. And I wasn't, I understood that I had created it. I had created the relationship with my, you know, whatever family people that had this thinking. And as soon as I took responsibility and realized what it was and let it go, it went away. Wow. Fascinating. Yeah. Fascinating. So it's just like this thought process of realizing what, it, how it manifested in your body and just poof, gone. Very yeah. cool. Very yeah. cool. So what kind of entrepreneurs do you work with in your Eagle Institute? Is there a threshold of like what they need to be making as a minimum? Can it be any business owner? Do they have to be C-level? What kind of entrepreneurs? Typically seven figure and over, um, typically eight figure and over. But I've worked with some that are just starting out that have had previous experience or that have big goals um, or that their businesses are going to be at that level fairly quickly. Uh, it really it really depends. Yeah. And, and it depends on their past level of experience as well um, to be able to scale. So, OK. And I don't, what? I don't teaching, I, although I'm qualified to teach scaling very much so, um, but I work on them being who they need to be and bringing the mental emotional skills because the time we're in right now, things are changing and they're going to continue to change because the society demands on business are really changing and it's, it's more evident for smaller businesses because they can make the changes and a lot of people are leaving um, larger organizations because they want things to be different but they don't have the vision the skills the experience and a practical sense on how that's to be different so that can get very stressful <laughs> mm. so it's like what and open and cutting off that stress response allows people or keeping it to a minimum at least allows people to tune into their intuition, their creativity, to not waste time. Like people don't realize, like I've trained so many people that work 12 plus hours per day. They learn to do this and they're like, I can get everything done in two hours a day. I had one entrepreneur that was burnt out. He had a multiple eight figure business and he's like, I do more in an hour now than I used to do in 13 hours a day. Wow. That's impressive. That's so impressive. Yeah. Because you're not wasting time on things and you're actually working on root cause on things, which your mind can't see when it's stressed out. When you're stressed out or worse, everything looks like an emergency, even when it's not, or everything looks important. You lose the discernment about what's actually going to move the dial. I struggled with that in the beginning with my, or not even in the beginning, it was almost like three or four years in all of a sudden I started thinking everything was urgent. I couldn't step away from my computer. I'd be working nights and mornings and during the day. And it was really, really bad. I actually had a coach who helped me with that, which was so helpful. Yeah. Um, so talk to me a little, a little bit about how you got here to this place where you decided to help other entrepreneurs. I have that, you know, you were a big swimmer. You broke three Canadian records in swimming and you were ranked number five in the world in 50 back and number seven in a hundred back, which is really impressive. Plus being a business owner, how did you get into this managing stress, burnout, and helping with these ancient techniques? Well, I started very early on. So the first company that I was involved in as an owner, I took it over. It was a 
family business and it wasn't really being run because there were other businesses that were much more successful. <laughs> um, and I think they were kind of waiting for me to graduate university. I'm like, she can do that one. <laughs> Uh, which I, I wasn't really my plan, but it kind of worked out that they approached me in the right way that I agreed to do it. Um, but it was incredibly difficult. I was in the company was hemorrhaging um, money. There were huge losses um, and it was in a very difficult industries, um, transportation, seating. So that's planes, trains um, and um, uh, a little bit of military work. Uh, automotive appliance trim, which was even more stressful than automotive because the quality standards were much higher. It's something that's going to be in somebody's home that they're touching and using every day. The deadlines were extremely short. Um, the pressure to, um, I mean, you shut GM down, it's a million dollars an hour. So every single thing, and we had very short timelines to get things done, often only hours. And if you're late, you're done. <laughs> that's that just yeah. that's just the way it was. So, and people around me, um, and my, especially my customers and their supply chains, and even our suppliers as well. Like, there were, people were having like heart attacks and strokes, and I'm like, why didn't this guy? I mean, it was all men. <laughs> Let's be real. <laughs> I was the only woman in sight, um, and I'm like, why aren't these guys retiring? And I'm like, oh, he's 33. He's 42. He's 37. And I'm like, I thought these guys were in their seventies. Wow. Um, and I'm just like, this is the path that I'm on. Cause I could start to see, like, I wasn't able to, to work as much, work out as much exercise as much. I started meditating. I started learning a bunch of different things, uh, because I, I saw that, I wasn't going to live very long. Like literally one of my clients had their um, chief operating officer and their head of production, uh, both in the hospital for months at the same week. Um, mm. And the owner of the company called us. He literally didn't know what needed to be done. And they were trying to make sure they didn't shut anybody down and the whole company would go under. And that company employed like several thousand people. Wow. So, <laughs> yeah. So that basically led you to like meditation and yeah. learning stress, yeah. but then how did you decide to leave that position and start your own business? Well, that was, I was involved as an owner in that business. Um, so, and then that evolved. I started doing my yoga and pranayama teacher training. And then I just saw that industry, um, it just were there were so many challenges in that industry and they you know the the choice was either i took over the whole thing which i did not want to do um or have somebody else buy the company and so i brought it to the other owners that um own the company i'm like i i yeah someone needs to buy us cuz i i don't want to do like i don't want to take it over cuz they wanted me to take it over and at the same time, I had started to teach yoga and that was going pretty well. Um, and then I actually had, but I realized I was way ahead of the curve for where I lived. I knew that would be, if I chose to do that only, it was going to take 15, 20 years for it to be something the size that I was interested in. And then I was approached with another business idea, which was my luxury wood door company. And I'm like, I can grow this one really fast. It'll be fun. It's an easier industry. It's still manufacturing, which I love. And uh, yeah, so I, I did that and I phased myself out of teaching yoga and just worked on my own practice until some of my entrepreneur friends are like, I was telling them about a bunch of business problems and they're like, how are you just standing there so calmly saying all this? <laughs> And I'm like, well, I meditate and, and they're like, whatever you're doing, we need some, of, I need some of this because I would be in the hospital if I was going through what you're going through right now. And I just thought, well, this is just, you know, stuff that happens in business. <laughs> and I'd seen a lot worse in my life for sure. And, but they just didn't have the skills in order to do it and not take it personally, like to learn what you needed to learn to grow um, and not go through the stress, which I wasn't, I mean, to me, I'm like, yeah, would I rather not do this? Absolutely. But it was necessary 
that's, you know, there are some necessary things at times, but even with good manifesting, we need to clean up the old stuff to get onto the better new stuff, right? So that that's what I was going through at the time. And so they asked me to start teaching them. And then that started the Eagle Institute. And then from there, it just snowballed. And was it like referrals? Did you market yourself? Or, and then how did you step away from that other business? I sold my shares in that okay. other business. Yeah. Okay. And I, hmm, it was actually challenging because I'd been in product-based businesses in the past. So I, and I happen to be a really good speaker. So I would get a lot of clients through speaking. Um, so that was one of the first things I did and I was more a professional speaker and then I would pick up, you know, clients to teach. Um, and then during COVID, it just got really easy <laughs> uh, cause everybody was online. Yeah. I've been online for years cause I'd had, you know, clients around the, around the globe. And I, I did have pretty good networks from my, um, entrepreneurial journey of other entrepreneurs but yeah that was actually the most challenging thing because it was ahead of the curve and people weren't really aware that meditation they weren't even really aware that stress like people were still thinking it was a good thing um, people weren't aware of the power of meditation and controlling your mind and stuff like that so it was definitely a lot harder with this business in the early days than it was in my other companies because they were established industries there was something very tangible that you could see. So I was really good at marketing and sales on that type of thing, but it was very different when somebody has to participate. And also when they're in stress, it's hard to see the pro <laughs> the way out, right? <laughs> so that, that, do you that, find that, was a, that was a big learning curve for me. Yeah. And do you find that some people when they're so deep in stress, almost don't want help because that's just like one more thing for them? Because I feel like that their might brains happen. actually tell them they can't. Yeah. So I, I had to that. get to the point where, and, and I can do this now because I've had enough practice. Is that they can tune if if they can get, especially if we're on video together, um, or one on one or live, anything live, um, they can tune into my energy and they start to calm down and they start to realize it can be different. Do but you ever get stressed? anymore or not is that just not even a thing very very rarely sometimes I, I don't get stressed but sometimes I'll you know start to go down a path like what if and I'm like whoa 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 no <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then I know to stop and to practice and mm. what practice is to do and get myself turned around very quickly so um, and I've been extremely practiced at this in, in very challenging situations. So, so let's shift gears here for a little second. Um, yeah. you were talking about growth and how you recognize you could grow companies quickly. What advice do you have for women entrepreneurs who are listening to this right now and they want to grow their business? Mm -hmm. The first thing you're growing is yourself because everything, um, you know, I'm also a Jonah in theory of constraints and in any organization to optimize it, you have to, you have a constraint and that's a good thing. Um, in a company, you want the constraint to be internal and to optimize it. But a lot of times entrepreneurs make themselves their, cons the constraint in their business. They will do this sometimes in a very physical sense. But most of the time, it's in a mental, emotional sense. So we can manifest and we are manifesting faster than we have before. So if you're getting more of the same, it's because the thinking needs to change. The, the beliefs need to change. The mental, emotional journey needs to change. The stress needs to come down. The less stress, the more happy, the more joyful you are, the better you can receive better answers and you can manifest things a lot faster. That is job one. And, and for, for people that are new to becoming an entrepreneur, um, they, some people really understand this. Some people are used to doing a ton of action to get things done, but if the mental emotional state, the beliefs and being in the right state to kind of receive what you want with ease, um, with non resistance with joy, if that's not there first, it makes it really hard. 
And not to say it can't be done, because I've seen people do amazing things with a hard journey. But why do it that way when it doesn't have to be that way? And the ones that I've seen that have grown the fastest is that there's much less resistance to being able to do that. Um, I had a great quote that I had a client once who always said, what you resist persists. And that has stuck with me yep. for years now, years. And whenever I find myself fighting something internally, I think of that and I'm like, oh yes, okay. I need to stop resisting and try to get to the bottom of this, you know, the root of it. Um, can you please tell us in your experience and your advice, what you think the most yeah. important action item is to grow a business to seven figures? People. People, people, you, people, 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 people. <laughs> can you expand so on first that? First of all is you. <laughs> be the person you need to be, like believe, keep the stress down because that's attracting, it's affecting your thinking, but it's also affecting who you're going to attract. Make yourself the best leader you can be and be amazing at hiring. Do you have advice for people hiring? Yes. Um, get the book, Who. <laughs> um, it's, oh gosh, I, I, it's escaping me, the name is, um, but it really forces you, A, to be clear about what you're hiring for. And most people, even with a lot of training, and I've had consultants I've paid $50,000 to that have done not hired correctly, because of they weren't doing this right. And they're, they're kind of like, yeah, it's 50, you know, 50, 50. It's not, if you hire right, you should be like 85, 95% a good hire the first time. And part of it's being really honest with yourself about what's really needed. Cause a lot of times, especially people that are starting out, they want to, and especially if you're an entrepreneur and that's those first few people on the team, you want people, the tendency is to desire people that are like you. And in some ways you want people like you, you want them to have the same values or close enough in values that there's going to be a match. You can trust their decision-making. But if you don't understand what's clearly required in a role and you're not willing to allow people to be complimentary to you and, and skills that you don't need or that you don't need to succeed at your role, then you're going to have a hard time because your company will be lopsided. Mm -hmm. So, and then, it, and then it's having the skills yourself to listen and to be able to manage, to understand um, that you're hiring for skills that you don't have and a point of view that's going to be different than yours. And then being able to manage um, listening to that and knowing when to and knowing when not to. And, and a bit of that's experience, but you know, there's some time, and, and be, if you're not stressed, you can tune into your intuition. Your intuition will definitely help you with that. But yeah, being amazing at hiring. Hmm. So, was it always a goal of yours to hit seven figures? Did it just come organically? Did you have to change your mindset a bit? I mean, you were talking a little bit about how you were in a different sector almost with your previous yeah. business experience. So talk to us a little bit about how you grew this business and the, the organic way it grew. In this one or previous ones? Let's talk about uh, this one. Beagle. Yeah, so this one um, was definitely the hardest one <laughs> I've had because uh, the the marketing and sales was a lot different. It was a lot more sophisticated. There's a lot more in the decision making process than there is, um, you know, in buying a luxury product or even like B two B sales where you really have a relationship. But it's very very well defined what you're getting. And there's not a lot of participation on the end of the, the client to get to the end result or the customer to get to the end result. So yeah, um, so it, it really took a lot in terms of um, figuring out and listening in a different way to where people were at. And I had to do a lot of learning. Like mm -hmm. I had to be willing to be a beginner in things and be okay with that. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I had something very similar um, when I was a VA and I was getting clients. It was more marketing my skills. And then when I changed to helping women, training women how to take their skills to become online business owners, it was more about meeting them on their journey, figuring out their pain points and how to get them to work with me to sign up and, you know, how that be different. And it, it was, it's, it was a struggle. And sometimes I still think it'd be a struggle. At times. I learned something really valuable when I was at my luxury wood door company. And this is less than one in 1000 companies actually know why their clients are buying. Hmm. Um, because what we think we're offering of value and it very may well be a value, but it's not how the customers will define it. Mm. About four in 1,000 companies know what it is on average, and about one in 1,000 know what it is and are able to execute on it. And everyone thinks, no, that's not me. But yeah, I, I have my luxury with door company. We had it wrong. I mean, it, mm -hmm. it seemed pretty simple because I mean, we were doing extremely well. Like I had to cut, you know, hold back on our growth in order to keep the quality high. And um, we still didn't know why people were buying. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. It, it just, uh, putting a lot of um, understanding into that can be very useful. Yeah. I so um, hired a combination of intuition and also listening. Right. Yes. I hired a copywriter for my webpage and she was asking me these questions and I was answering them. And then she said, but I mean, have you asked your students really specifically about this? And I was like, well, yeah, I, I'm pretty sure this is it. But then when I started getting down and like sending out surveys and getting them, I realized they were like my, what I thought the pain point I thought was really just this really blanket surface level thing. And it was a lot deeper between almost like a subset under a bullet point, right. That they had, and that helped us get so much clearer and helped me get so much clearer on my, my marketing as well. Um, so tell us a little bit, what has been your best investment and your worst investment that you've made as a business owner? The best investments I've always made have been in training myself. And investing in a serious meditation practice, um, the and learning definitely. Um, worst investments I've ever made. Hmm. I think not listening, like something in my intuition saying, "Yeah, not it's not either not the right time or there's a better way of doing it." But even that I still consider valuable because there was learning that, that came from it. So I wouldn't say there's any really bad ones. Uh, I, I've been very fortunate that way. I, I don't think I've had a lot of really bad investments. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Maybe it's like, because you're so connected to yourself. That's yeah. my guess why you don't have a lot. What are some common, you know, pushbacks or hesitations that people might have about working with you in your business? I think the biggest one is that feeling hopeful enough that it can really make a difference. Mm. And the other one is, uh, I think, is people trusting themselves to actually do it. Yeah, that I could imagine that would be hard. Yeah. Have you ever yeah, had a I actually created programs that took that into account? Like uh, that, because I, I, my background as an athlete, I know how to train. So mm -hmm. as, as a athlete, you rarely train on your own. You always have a coach there, right? So I set yes. things up that the programs are done. Um, like when I learned to meditate, it was like pretty much independent study. Like you would go once a week, a month, something like that. You'd be given a technique and then it was like, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> come back when you're ready for the next one but I'm like this 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 didn't agree with my sports background and my understanding of how to learn things quickly and not everybody has that level of discipline especially today when there's so many distractions like it's not just that um we're you know our society's changing very quickly but the amount of pressure and the amount of things that create stress and overwhelm if you don't know how to control it yourself you can lose focus just so easily so i created programs that create enough of the structure so that people can get the discipline to do it on a regular basis 
um, and get the feedback from a real person. And then also working directly with somebody who's got a brain that can be calm. <laughs> Mm. So that, that helps with it, but it's all the creating the structure that people are doing shorter things more often so that they're, they're not only reinforced in learning the skills, but in creating a practice. So by the time they're done working with us, um, they have enough experience to see what it looks like and feels like and how they're different from practicing on a regular basis. Like I literally- Hopefully it yeah. becomes a habit, right? With well, we help them create that yeah. habit. Yeah. And I've literally had like clients that have done some of our longer programs say to me, I have a big problem to solve or I have a big meeting. So I saved it till after. Our <laughs> like I, they literally scheduled it after our class, you know, our scheduled training in class. So have you ever had a client or customer be unhappy? How did you absolutely? Work that? Yeah. How did yeah. you work through that? And try to resolve well, a it. lot of it had to do with um expectations or things that like sometimes I actually have to push people into facing their their weaknesses or their blind spots like I'm like they're ready for it they just don't want to do it <laughs> mm. so um and sometimes that is the right thing to do even if the person's not happy about it and the majority of them have come back after the fact and said you you, you did me a favor, but at the time it was really uncomfortable. So, mm. so when you see your business, I and meditate and say like, is, you know, is this me? Do I, you know, did I do something? Should, do I need to change what I'm doing? So where do you see your business going in the next five years, say next five years, the, the goal is to be, be well beyond 10 figure a year. Good for you. Do you have plans? Have you ever thought about like selling your business? Or have no. an exit plans? No. Exit plan will hopefully be, yes, either another owner or um what well, well, by the time we're ready to do it, who knows what the world is going to look like. Um, I've seen things intuitively. Um, it may be an IPO, it may be just turning it over to an employee-led organization. Um, it could be turning ownership over to employees entirely. Like it could look like a lot of different things. So if you could distill down advice into one thing, if women are trying to hit seven figures, what would you say to them? Oh, I mean, first of all, believe, but it, it, there's got to be space to grow. That's the most, that's another really important concept. And again, that goes back to dialing back the stress because that creates a lot of space. So if you think about a plant, and this has happened to me multiple times in, in my companies is like they reach a, a, they seem like a plateau that's hard to get through. And it's either an, a mental, emotional breakthrough or a belief breakthrough that I had to get over. Um, but also I needed to get things off my schedule. But and still have them they either they're not necessary. So they're just go in the trash bin. Um, and that's one thing we do help people with if they're if they're in burnout. Um, and the other thing is how to delegate and do appropriate follow up and have the quality in, in place to know that it's being done at the level that's required for your company to grow and succeed. So in myself, the years where I had less off my plate is when we had the biggest growth mm. because I was part of the growth creation. So if, if you're so, if it's like being in a, a plant, being in a little pot, the roots get all entangled and it has nowhere to go. But if you put, put it in a bigger plant, a bigger space where there's more room for the roots to grow, then the plant grows. I mean, the same thing with businesses, except for your, you are the constraint. So get yourself out of the way. <laughs> get in a bigger pot. Get in a bigger pot. Yeah. <laughs> I just had that this uh, weekend. I was planting my garden outside and you know, that like the little seedlings, they come in like these tiny little boxes and the roots are all messed up. So yeah, not messed up, but all entangled. And you have to like put it in your garden so that it has a chance to grow. So it's a very appropriate um, analogy right there. So yeah. tell us our audience, where can they find you if they want to work with you, if they want to connect with you? 
yeah, if they want to work with me, um, we have a free, very short video, 16 minutes. So anyone, even if they're going through stress or to burn out, you can handle this. Um, the Eagle Institute dot net forward slash less dash stress dash better dash results. So we will make sure to put that in our show notes. Yeah. And then also they can just look us up on LinkedIn. So um, you can look up the Eagle Institute um, or yeah, just look up the Eagle Institute on LinkedIn or awesome. my YouTube channel is also the Eagle Institute. Thank you. What is one philosophy mantra or quote that you try to run your business by? Hmm. So non-resistance internally wins. Um, the number one priority is the highest mental emotional state that you can accomplish in that moment. And that leads to well-being and that opens up opportunities that you probably can't even imagine. Oh, beautiful. That's so helpful. So thank you for joining me again on this, Kira. Really appreciate it for our audience. And for our audience, if you are listening to this show and you really resonated with Kira, what with what Kira was saying with stress and burnout, and growing your business, please do one little favor and help us grow the show by finding another person who would find this episode valuable. Until next time, you can find me on LinkedIn, tag me on Instagram at virtuallykiri and hope to chat with all of you again soon with another interview.